and welcome to session 18 of our Vision and Commitment course. In this session, we're going to look at the subject of breaking bread, sometimes known as the Lord's Supper or communion, uh, sometimes the covenant meal. And then we will dare to address the unspeakable topic of money. And this used to be the final topic in the Vision and Commitment course because it was so controversial, but those were the good old days. And uh, nowadays we've got uh, sessions that are far more controversial. So that's a little teaser for the next two sessions. Okay, so that said, let's jump right into the scripture. And in Acts 2, verses 42 to 47, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In the last session, we saw that to be in fellowship means to be joined together with others in outworking a common purpose. The Greek word translated as fellowship in Acts 2.42, koinonia, is translated elsewhere in the New Testament as sharing. In this session, we will look at two further ways in which we express fellowship with God and one another, sharing bread and wine, the Lord's Supper, and sharing our finances. The Lord's Supper. Luke 22, 19 to 20 says this, And he, Jesus, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. As we see in Acts 2, the early church was devoted to breaking bread with one another. Now, I just want to remind you of what we spoke of in the last session, this issue of being devoted. It was wholehearted adhering to something. And, you know, when I think about it, the other things that they were devoted to, I think in many ways make much more sense to us. It makes sense to me that they would be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Kind of makes sense to me that they'd be devoted to uh, fellowship. It makes sense that they'd be devoted to prayer. But isn't it strange that they were actually devoted to breaking bread? It wasn't some quaint function, some quaint ceremony. It wasn't some occasional thoughtless thing. They were actually devoted to breaking bread. I wonder if it's because perhaps they saw something more than we do about the significance of breaking bread. I want to suggest to you that that is exactly it. I believe the early church saw something of the wonder of what happens when we break bread with one another, which has been so lost over the centuries. My prayer is that we would see that recaptured in the church, that sense of the, the wonder and the transforming power, the passion that the early church had in this practice. This term can simply mean eating together, but we know that they were also committed to sharing bread and wine in obedience to the command of Jesus and in remembrance of him. Churches through the ages have practiced this in one form or another. In some cases, it has become so ceremonial and ritualistic as to have lost all sense of intimacy. In others, it has become so casual as to have lost all sense of awe and wonder. We need to look at the intention of Jesus in directing us to remember him in this way. And it is helpful to start by considering the roots of the practice. In Luke 22, we have an account of what has become known as the Last Supper. Jesus had gathered with his disciples to partake in the Passover meal, an annual Jewish event commemorating one of the greatest moments in Israel's history, the deliverance of their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. 
by his imminent death, Jesus was going to bring about a far greater deliverance, deliverance from slavery to sin and Satan. In anticipation of this, he inaugurated a wonderful way to help us contemplate the significance of this deliverance and to celebrate it. And so first thing that we're realizing here is that this is something that is given to us that we might remember. I don't know about you, but one of the things that has always been staggering to me as I've read through scripture is the way that God's people can forget. It seems like the people of God are the most forgetful people on the face of the earth. You know, you think back, don't you, to those early Israelites coming out of Egypt and even as Moses ascends the mountain to get the commandments, they seem to forget the God who has done such miraculous things among them to an extent where they make an idol, a golden calf to worship. How could they have forgotten the plagues? How could they have forgotten the parting of the Red Sea? But I think the people of God are amazingly forgetful. And I believe that God, in his love and wisdom for us, gives us practices that will help us never forget. You know, there's a certain verse in um, 2 Timothy 2, verse 8. I, I always find it humorous. In this verse, Paul says to Timothy, he says, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead descended from David. I don't know about you, but if I was Timothy in that context, I would be somewhat insulted at that point. Remember Jesus Christ? I'm hardly likely to forget him. My life is given in service to him. But it's not just that Paul says, remember Jesus Christ. He says, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead. As if he genuinely is forgetting. Remember Jesus raised from the dead? Descendants of David, it's almost like Timothy saying, Jesus Christ, was that again? Oh, raised from the dead. No, I'm still not getting it. Descendant of David, oh, right. Okay, Jesus Christ, I've got it. It's just a remarkable little verse. But every time I read it, I'm just reminded that you can be absolutely even engaged in the purposes of God. You can be engaged in church life. And so enjoying the wonder of fellowship and relationship and forgetting Jesus. You know, we can enjoy fellowship so much that we can forget that he himself is the essence of everything that we have that is good in relating to one another. We must not forget Jesus Christ. And so a covenant meal. As already noted, this act can be referred to simply as breaking bread, but it has been given several specific names by the church, the Lord's Supper, in 1 Corinthians 11, 20, the Eucharist from the Greek verb meaning to give thanks in 1 Corinthians 11, 24, the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, and communion in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, albeit in the King James Version. It has also often been referred to as the covenant meal. A covenant is a binding agreement or special arrangement. Covenants in biblical times were usually celebrated with a meal, rather like a marriage banquet. Marriage is, of course, a covenant. As Christians, we are beneficiaries of the new covenant, the arrangement that God made, enabling those who trust in the saving work of Jesus on the cross to live in right relationship with him. Our covenant meal celebrates this. It's not a once only meal like a wedding reception or even just once a year like the Passover meal. We can and should celebrate it regularly. And so this meal that we have is a meal of celebrating the amazing covenant that we have in relationship with God. It's greater than any marriage. That's something that should sober us in our thinking straight away. You know, that meal that you get invited to after the wedding, it's such a privilege to be there, isn't it? It's such an honor to be part of a group of people that have been chosen, selected, and invited to celebrate the union of two lives together. But brothers and sisters, understand this. That marriage is a pale reflection, actually, of the wonder 
of breaking bread. Isn't it remarkable that we can come to it with such casual, non-stirred, uh, non-impressed reaction? Isn't it amazing that we can come to it with such disregard, such casualness? I believe that we need to capture something of the wonder again of what we're celebrating. Where? Sometimes breaking bread will take place at gatherings of the whole church. We see this in, in Acts 27 and 1 Corinthians 11, 20 and 22, but it can be anywhere that any Christians are together. As already noted, the believers in Jerusalem were breaking bread in their homes. The home can provide a great environment in which to share, give thanks and pray together in an unhurried and meaningful way. Now, listen, I'm a big believer in the significance of breaking bread in our homes. How many of you know that sometimes when you gather with fellow believers, you can have an evening together where the conversation may be polite and friendly, but have you know that sometimes it can be shallow? Sometimes it can just be not that significant. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with just shooting the breeze. There's nothing wrong with just talking about work and talking about sports and none of these things in and of themselves are wrong. But you know what? God has done something so much uh, richer and more wonderful. And oftentimes we need something to remind us of the wonder of that. You know, any time when I've broken bread with people on a small, intimate level, like after a meal, immediately it brings the whole thing into a deeper level. I find that often it will be that that will lead into great conversations, a richness of opening, a sense of the wonder of our joining in Christ. And I believe that it's largely been lost in our homes and we need to recapture it. I want to encourage you that are listening to this. I want to encourage you that are part of our churches to give more attention to why not break bread at the end of a meal? Why not just have a little wine, a little bread, and after we've eaten, say, hey, listen, let's break bread together. Let's just give thanks for our covenant. See what happens. See what happens to the evening just by that practice. It's something that we can see restored. What? The bread is just ordinary bread and the wine, ordinary wine. They are not sacred in and of themselves, nor made sacred by prayer or any other process. They represent the body and blood of Jesus, but contrary to what some denominations teach, they do not become his actual flesh and blood. Okay, now I know that for most of you, you wouldn't think along these ways, but many of you watching, many of you listening may have come from a more traditional background that may have taught something called transubstantiation. And this is the belief that somehow through a priest or someone praying over the bread and the wine, it literally is uh, transformed into the actual flesh of Jesus and blood of Jesus. Um, in the Latin mass, there used to be, uh, or still is, in the Latin mass, you'll hear the statement, um, hoc est corpus, and that's the body of Christ. And it's actually that statement that many believe turned into the hocus pocus statement that was said really to mimic and mock what was going on in that, like a magic taking place. Now listen, what we're saying is this, the bread represents the body of Christ and the wine represents his blood, but it's not transformed into this strange sort of cannibalistic act where this thing is actually turned into something. Now listen, I was brought up in such a tradition and uh, it was a serious business, you know, um, not really to me, to be honest with you, because I was a very naughty altar boy who used to do very naughty things a lot of the time. And one of the things that I used to do was um, I used to steal the hosts, you know, the little wafer things, because I thought they tasted pretty good. So I remember just taking a wadge of them and sticking them in my pocket, you know, and uh, not the stuff that had been changed, but just the pre stuff, you know, and, and I just remember um, one time, um, just the next day at school, just eating these hosts during class and just watching my friend's face as they're just like, oh, 
the body of Christ he's eating, you know. And of course, it was just little wafers. And the terrible wafers, well, they stick to the roof of your mouth awfully. Some of you know exactly what I mean. I remember one time just picking up hot hair and the priest coming past and just slapping my hand, you know, like, and I was thinking, what's your problem? You know, it's like, what, the roof of my mouth is okay, but my finger isn't, you know. So anyway, there was lots of strange thinking over the years with this whole business. But again, you know, the enemy loves to confuse these things, turn it into something that is so different, we believe, than is outlined in scripture and is clear and is intentional. And so when... The Bible does not tell us exactly when or how frequently to do it. The believers in Jerusalem met together every day and may have broken bread in this way every day. Uh, in Acts 27, we read that the believers in Troas came together on the first day of the week to break bread, though we cannot assume they only or even always broke bread on the first day of the week. However, since Jesus commanded us to do it in remembrance of him, it should be certainly a regular part of our fellowship. Who? Only those who know they are saved through Christ's death on the cross should participate because it only applies to them. However, all for whom this is the case can participate. A believing child does not have to have attained a certain age. Okay, so again, in certain traditions, you have what's called Holy Communion around the age of 11 years old. Again, this is not a biblical practice. Any child that is an authentic believer should participate in the covenant meal in this way. Nor does a person have to be a member of the congregation. A church leader does not have to officiate. Any Christian may offer the bread and wine to others. Okay, so again, anybody can administrate this. That's why we can do this in our homes. And, um, and again, I, I want to say that if you are born again, if you're a child of God, one of the wonders of breaking bread, it is a cross-denominational experience. I love breaking bread with brothers and sisters in other expressions of the body of Christ, because it's a reminder that despite our theological differences, we are one. We are one. We are one body. And so breaking bread is one of the great ways in which we can do that. And so what's the point of it? The Lord's Supper is sometimes referred to as a sacrament. By sacrament, some denominations mean a religious act that is an outward physical sign of an inward spiritual reality, though others go as far as to say that sacraments convey a benefit to the partaker irrespective of that person's spiritual state. There is no biblical justification for this latter view. Just as baptism, which is also often referred to as a sacrament, does nothing unless one is submitted to it in obedient response to salvation, neither does taking the bread and wine. However, just as baptism is of great significance for those who approach it properly, the Lord's Supper should be also. Okay, so again, not such a big deal to those of you that haven't come from a dispensing sacrament type of tradition, but this is a big deal for those that have come from that way of thinking. It's something that there needs to be revelation from God for them to actually understand these things in a different way, that this is not some kind of mysterious magic that is imparted by the church to people, but this is something that is embraced by faith by those who really have encounters with God and know the reality of what they're doing in partaking in whether it's water baptism or breaking bread. So what is the significance of the Lord's Supper and what truths are conveyed by it? In 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34, Paul shows that our attention is to be directed in several different ways as we participate in this act. We are to, first of all, look back. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, we read, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper directs our thoughts back in history to the cross. The bread reminds us of Christ's body given up for us, and the wine reminds us of his blood shed for us. We are sobered 
and filled with gratitude as we consider the cost of our salvation paid willingly by Jesus out of his great love for us. We proclaim it to one another and determine to proclaim it to the world. So first of all, it causes us to look back to the cross. And can I just say this? It's looking at the cross that deals with all the pettiness of church life. Mm -hmm. There are so many things in church life that bother us, get to us. He didn't say hi. I don't like how loud it is in here. Mm -hmm. I don't like how cool it is in here. I don't like the style of the worship. Oh, what pettiness. What pettiness. Imagine for a second a glimpse of the cross while you're complaining about such shallow things. Sometimes I think to myself, God, would you just give us all a glimpse of your cross right now? If only we could for a moment see the gore and the horror and the wonder of the cross, surely all complaint would go. Surely we would all consider it such a privilege to be part of your people. Surely all of us would be wholehearted at that point. We look at the cross. So in breaking bread, one of the things that we're doing is just looking at the cross, remembering him. Also, we look up. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24. We take the bread and wine in remembrance, not just of his death, but also to focus on Jesus himself. While not brushing over Christ's suffering on the cross, we must never forget that it was followed by the resurrection. He's no longer dead. The supper reminds us to look up with eyes of faith, to see Jesus seated at the Father's right hand in glory and to worship him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always reminded of the, the guys on the road to Emmaus, you know, after the resurrection of Christ. They were so deeply impacted by what they'd seen of the cross. They'd seen the crucifixion of Jesus and they were walking along downcast and suddenly there's one walking along with them and the one walking along with them says, what's wrong? What's going on with you guys? And they say, what are you new around here? You don't know what's happened. This Jesus of Nazareth, this amazing prophet that we thought were, was going to be the Messiah has been crucified. And the man walks with them. And as he walks with them, he begins to show them all the wonders of Christ throughout the history of Scripture. And then at a certain point, he stops and he breaks bread. And suddenly their eyes are opened and they realize it's Jesus. And they say, oh, didn't his words burn in our hearts? Brothers and sisters, don't you think that that story is in scripture for a reason. There's something of the breaking of bread at that point that suddenly open their eyes to the wonder of the resurrected Christ. There is something of the resurrected Christ that he wants to reveal to us as we break bread with one another. It's the risen Christ that we're celebrating. And next we look around because there is one bread we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. The Lord's Supper is a communal meal. We take it with other Christians. When Paul refers in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine to recognizing the body of the Lord, he is speaking not of the bread, but of fellow believers the body of Christ. As he goes on to say, now you, plural, are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And so as we eat and drink, we should look around at our spiritual brothers and sisters, thanking the Lord for joining us to them. There is a sobering aspect to this too, which we'll look at in a moment. But just to say, 
One of the wonders of breaking bread is the revelation, again, of the unity of the body of Christ. And this brings us back to all that we spoke of when speaking about Ephesians 4 ministries and their vital purpose in bringing together the body of Christ, in us seeing the expression of the unity of the church. Well, so does breaking bread. Breaking bread is part of this miracle of, hey, we come from one loaf. We're many members, but we are actually of the same root and origin. We are collectively one. And there is such joy, isn't there, that we get as we do celebrate the union that we have with brothers and sisters. As I said before, particularly those who belong to different expressions of the body of Christ. Look within. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, 28 to 29, it says, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Many suppose this to mean that we need to check whether we are free of sin before we eat the body of the Lord, i.e. supposedly the bread. This can lead some to refrain from partaking if they don't feel worthy. The Lord's Supper can certainly make us mindful of shortcomings in our walk with the Lord. But where necessary, we should just repent and receive God's forgiveness. We can then thankfully participate in the act that reminds us that we rely on Christ's performance and not our own. Okay, so you hear what we're saying here. We're not saying that... We shouldn't examine our hearts and see if there's something that we need to repent of. That's absolutely right. We should do that. But that's not the essence of what's being addressed here when it's talking about uh, a consciousness of the body of Christ. OK, because what we know is if we are sinful or if we are something we need to repent of, we should just repent of it. It's not about our performance anyway. So we don't break bread based on how good we've lived. We don't break bread on, on the basis of how good our week has been. It's all about what Christ has done anyway. If we've understood anything thus far in this course, it's nothing to do with our performance and it's all to do with his. So it's not about our performance. So what is it talking about then? Well, let's come back to the notes. However, as previously noted, the body of the Lord that we are to recognize and in regard to which we are to examine ourselves is our spiritual family. The problem in Corinth was that many were selfishly being disrespectful and dismissive of their brothers and sisters in Christ. Their approach to the Lord's Supper made it a travesty and brought God's judgment. This covenant meal is meant to demonstrate our oneness as believers. By it, we declare we are joined together in Christ. I love you and I'm for you. If this is not actually our heart, we are inviting God's judgment. We must, therefore, take the opportunity to deal with any grievances there and then. If you remember in our previous session, we got into those passages in Matthew where it talked about the onus is always on you to work it out. Whether the fault is yours or the fault is someone else, the onus is always on you. And so... This is something that we do quite frequently in the church. We'll encourage people to examine their hearts and we'll say, hey, if you've been offended by someone or you've offended somebody, um, now's the time to sort it out. Actually, before you break bread, go sort it out. And oftentimes when I bring that direction, I see a line beginning to form you know, of, of people who need to work things out with me, you know, and I get one of those little ticket machines and people take a number and stuff like that. And about three hours later, we're ready to break bread. But I can offend a lot of people, as you can imagine. But, uh, but the reality is it is something that has to be done on a frequent basis to make sure that we're honoring the body of Christ. It's really important. I remember one time uh, just hearing a friend of mine who uh, led a fairly large church in the UK. And uh, I remember him telling me once that there were two ladies in the church and he said they were kind of really solid women in the church, great women in the church, and they ended up getting into conflict with one another. And over time, their rift became deeper and deeper and their strength of feeling against one another just continued and yet they stayed within the same church. And he said at one point, after spending time with the Lord, he felt God say to him, 
lock them in a room <laughs> with the bread and the wine and tell them they can't come out until they've shared it. And so he did. He, he, he went in. He said, I want you guys to just come together. He sat them in a the table. He took out the bread. He took out the wine. He went to the door, moved out, locked it, and just shouted through the door, you're not coming out until you've broken bread and left. They're still there today. No, 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 no. I don't know how long it took, but over a significant period of time, they began to work out the issues that they had with one another. And by the end of it, they were able to break bread with one another. Okay, and so we also look forward. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, it says this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's not just about the past or even the present. It is also about the future. Our celebration now is just a foretaste of the unspeakable joy that awaits us when Christ returns. The Bible describes this in terms of a marriage when Christ, the bridegroom, will at last be united with the church, his bride. Therefore, as we partake in the Lord's Supper now, we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb that we read of in Revelation 19.9. It will be a meal to end all meals, a great heavenly banquet that will last forever. Brothers and sisters, when we break bread, we need to be celebrating our eternity. We need to be reminded that this is not just the wonder of us having great friendships. It's not just the wonder of us finding each other. It's not just the wonder of the cross. It's not just the resurrection of the Christ, but it's also his intention that we will forever be with him celebrating in such a way that the party just doesn't end. That's our destiny. That's our future. We get to celebrate. It's a foretaste of the wonder of that, that we celebrate in breaking bread. So food for thought. God in his great wisdom has given us this practice so that we might be continually reminded of what he has done for us through Christ it should be as significant to us as baptism, but with the advantage of it being something we can do again and again with ever deepening revelation. Let us turn now to another way of expressing fellowship with money. Mm -hmm. Now, before I get into this subject, I just wanna say, typically speaking, I teach these classes in the UK and the US and I'm often backwards and forwards between these countries. And I think there is no other subject that is as contrasting in the two countries as that of finance and the use of our finance. It's kind of interesting because I think we've got two polar extremes. In the UK, there is an intensely private view of money. You just don't talk about money. And one of the things that I believe the enemy has done very successfully in the UK is actually um, present the church as a money grabbing entity. That this organization, they're just after your money. And because of that, I think the church's pendulum swung away from teaching about finances. And rather than teaching the people of God how to properly use finances, they've decided we just won't talk about it at all for risk of being accused of being money grasping. The problem with this is that the people of God are not educated how to, by faith, use money effectively. And the church, and particularly ministers of the church, are actually kept poor as some sort of virtue. It's like, you know, you stay humble, we'll keep you poor. And there is something of an idea that there is some blessing and virtue in poverty. Can I just say this from the Bible clearly? There is no virtue in poverty. There's no shame in poverty. God loves the poor, but there's no virtue in it. When Jesus came to proclaim good news, it was good news to the poor. Now understand this. When you look at what he proclaimed, he proclaimed freedom for prisoners. He proclaimed sight for the blind. He proclaimed release for the oppressed. 
and he proclaimed good news for the poor. It wasn't good to be poor. The good news that Jesus was proclaiming to them was God's intention of blessing to come to them. Now, that's what's happened in the UK. There has been this idea of we just don't talk about money. And of course, what's happened in the US is an extreme other version where we talk about money all the time. And in actual fact, the message of the church becomes a very confusing message between the benefits and the blessing of eternal things with the benefits and the blessings of natural things. And what's happened is the God of this world, mammon, money, has actually been elevated and often what's preached is a gospel of materialism. It's a gospel that is based on the concept that the blessing of God is tied up with money and possessions. That's what it's all about. And so people are taught curious things that are mocked around the whole world concerning money. And so we have these extremes going on. Now, I believe there's a godly balance that we've got to find in all of this. And I'm committed to us doing it. So let's look at the godly balance. Let's look at what the Bible has to say about this. Let us turn now to another way of expressing fellowship with our money. Financial stewardship. Acts 2 verses 44, 45 and 4, 34 to 35 read like this. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. There was no needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. This aspect of the life of the early church may seem surprisingly radical to us, but it is entirely in keeping with their wholehearted response to the gospel. It is also in keeping with God's intention for his people. Let me just give you the key to everything we're about to say. It is simply this. If you're born again, everything is given to God. Everything. When you gave your life to Jesus, you didn't just pray a prayer of commitment. You didn't just ask his forgiveness. You said, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life, which means he's the Lord of everything, which means he's the Lord of your family. He's the Lord of your kids. He's the Lord of your home. It means that your car is Jesus's and your lawnmower is and your bank balance is and your 401k is. Everything is his. Now listen, when that revelation settles deeply on the hearts of believers, then everything I'm about to say becomes easy. But let me just say this. If as I teach what I'm about to teach, you're finding a wrestle in your soul, it's going to come down to the issue of, is everything the Lord's or not? See, the Bible teaches you give it all to God and he gives you the responsibility to steward what you have. You don't steward it as your own possession. You steward it as his possession. So let's get into the specifics of what we're talking about. Even a casual reading of scripture reveals that money plays an important part in the kingdom of God. It has been estimated that around 15% of Jesus's words recorded in the New Testament relate to money and financial issues, and that he says twice as much on these subjects as on faith and prayer combined, or on heaven and hell combined. It's shocking, isn't it? Yeah. That Jesus says so much about money and possessions. Why would he do that? It, was it that he was building up some big personal treasure chest in his ministry? There's no record of Jesus having possessions in his ministry to speak of. Can I just say this? God doesn't need your money. 
just to be clear, the God who created the heavens and the earth, he doesn't need your money. So why would Jesus address money so much? It's because he was determined to dethrone a false God that dominates the lives of many, be them rich or poor. Can I just say, you don't have to be wealthy to struggle with the love of money. In fact, I would argue there are far more people that struggle with the love of money that don't have wealth. The millions and millions of people buying lottery tickets <laughs> are not people who have abundance of wealth typically. They're people who are longing for the dream of massive amounts of wealth. They're longing for this gain that's going to come to them that will change everything and make them, oh, so much happier. If you ever do analysis into the lives of people that won lotteries, it is shocking to see how many lives are absolutely devastated by money. It is one of the great deceptions of the enemy that I believe that Jesus was committed to dethroning. And so money, the heart monitor. Contrary to popular belief, the Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. It's one of those things that's more quoted by non-Christians than anything. Well, you know what they say, money's the root of all evil. Well, that might be what they say, but it's not what the Bible says, okay? <laughs> money is not evil. God blesses us with it. However, in 1 Timothy 6, 10, we see that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Our attitude towards money and our handling of it can reveal a lot about us. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, it says in Matthew 6, 21. It is also a basis on which God will determine what of real and eternal value can be entrusted to us. Again, guys, I want to just say this. Money in itself is a neutral vehicle. It is not inherently evil. Even despite the way sometimes people speak of it, you know, these you know, filthy lucre, you know, the cold, hard cash. You know, people th speak of money in strange ways, but the truth is money is just a resource. Money in the pocket of the man who loves the Lord is a blessing and a benefit, not just to him, but to many. And yet the love of money, if you love it, it will wreck your life. It will ruin your life. It will produce fear and control in your life. So where is your heart? Is it really all his? Is it really all his? When you look at the sum total of your resources, do you look at it and say, God, it's all yours? Just ask of it, it's yours. This is the way we're to live if possessions are not to possess us. You see, we are supposed to be people who have possessions. We are supposed to be people who administrate possessions is probably a better way of putting it. But those possessions must never have us. We are never to be controlled by these things. It says in Luke 16 verses 10 to 12, it says, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? This is fascinating, this scripture that we've just looked at. Because Jesus addresses the issue of worldly wealth as that which is very little. Mm. He says, if you can't be faithful in very little, you won't be faithful in much. Is that how you see worldly wealth? Do you see it as very little? 
I have a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine. I remember one time we were talking about something and I just made the comment to him. I said, yeah, I know, but it's just money. And even that comment caused him to write. He said, he laughed. He said, well, yeah, it's money. And I said, yeah, but it's, it's just mo It's only money. It's just money. And, and again, he was like, yeah, but it's, it's money, money. <laughs> You know, and it was like, it could, I could tell that we were grappling with our value system connected with money. See, the reality is Jesus would look at money and he'd say, it's not that big of a deal. It's just money. And I believe that as children of God, we need to have an attitude towards money, which is not careless. It's not irresponsible, but it puts the right value on that which is just earthly wealth. It is not of eternal value unless we turn it to eternal value by sowing it to eternity. Yeah. When we sow it to eternity, it has great reward. But while it just remains our possession, it's very little, very little. And so if our desire is to be faithful to God with what he has given us, we must learn the importance of giving. And so godly giving. Second Corinthians 8, 7 says this, but just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. First thing I want to say about this, guys, is, you know, it's possible to excel in all these other things and not excel in the grace of giving, that's actually quite challenging. It means that we can actually be quite functioning people within the life of the church and not generous, not actually functioning in this grace of giving, which we're gonna unpack here right now. Before looking at specific types of giving, there are some fundamental truths that must be understood. First, we see in the above passage of scripture that Paul refers to giving as a grace. It is something that God graciously enables us to do, first by providing the resources, then by putting it in our hearts to share those resources with others. Giving is to be a spirit-led act of worship to God and a way of ministering his love to others. Secondly, we see that it is a grace in which we can grow and excel. This will happen as we reach to God for a greater revelation of his mind and heart in this regard. And as we actually do it, scripture gives us some very practical guidance to help us get started. Okay, let me just say some things on this. It is critical for us to understand that that which we have has been given to us by God. Listen, sometimes you hear people saying things like, I earn this with the sweat of my brow. You didn't earn it with the sweat of your brow. You earned it through the generosity of the heart of God. You see, because God provided the work for you to do to be able to earn. And where we start to put our confidence in our jobs and our careers, so many lives have been shipwrecked by trusting in that foundation. How many know that jobs change, companies close down, economies crash? It's not the sweat of your brow. It's the favor of God on your life. And if you remember that, it will help you keep your attitude right towards it. The other thing that I want you to understand that everything you have, you have because of the goodness of God. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of when my kids were young and they would come and ask me for money to buy me a present for my birthday. You know, I, and I think to myself, hold on a second, it's all mine. It's all mine. And sometimes they would take what I gave them and buy me some candy that I don't even like, but they like, you know, it's like, there's something about this which is strange, but, but the truth is in my heart there was joy. You know, when my children would come with the effort that they had put together to present something to me, I would never look at it and say, well, it's all mine. No way with it. 
<laughs> you know, I, never. You, you delight in your children responding and giving to you, even though you provided everything for them. Well, that is exactly the same with God and you. He doesn't need your money. He provides everything for you, but he delights in the generosity of your heart. You know why? Because you're acting just like your dad. He's looking for the characteristics of him in you, which is the characteristic of generosity. Also, we say here, this happens as we do it. <laughs> uh, you know what, guys? Good intentions is not the same as generosity. I know a lot of people that have had good intentions, but in actual fact, when it comes to the reality of their giving, you find that it's more in the imaginations of their minds than the actual doing of it. How many times have you sat and listened to a strong presentation? Needs have perhaps been put forward. Maybe you've looked at something that we've presented, One Church Ministries, what we're doing all over the world. And in that moment, you're stirred to do something, but then time passes and a bill comes in and a challenge happens and all of a sudden the good intention has not turned into generosity. This happens all the time. And so God gives us helpful, practical guidance. The first is to be systematic. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2a, we see this. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. Thought, prayer, and preparation should go into our giving. We should not be taken by surprise when it comes to the collection. Yeah. How many of you know this happens every week? You know, we take up tithes and offerings every week, but you'd still think it was a new thing that we came up with, the way some people react. Oh, oh, where's my wallet? Where's my... Oh, it's passed. It's gone. Oh, well, next week, which doesn't come. I'll catch up. God knows my heart. Yeah, he does know your heart. He knows that your heart is unprepared. He knows your heart, it's ill-disciplined. He knows your heart, it's forgetful. He knows your heart and your thoughts need to be helped by systematic giving. You're absolutely right that he knows your heart, but that's not a good excuse for lack of generosity and lack of preparation. And we should determine to give regularly and consistently. Some are inclined to wait until they feel led to give or to postpone it with the intent of catching up later in the month or year, they tend to end up giving relatively little. God understands how this can happen, so he tells us to give regularly and consistently. In proportion to our income, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. When deciding what to give, we start by looking at what we receive. Our giving should never be at the mercy of our fluctuating expenses. Okay, so what we're saying, guys, your expenses will always be up and down. Your giving should be consistent because it's how you're honoring God in a practical way. And so we start with that determination. So next, sacrificial. For they gave according to their means as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord. This is really interesting, because earlier we talked about a grace for giving, didn't we? Because what, what does it mean to give beyond your means? What do you mean they went into debt? Surely it doesn't mean get your credit card out and give beyond what you actually can give. No, it's not talking about beyond, in a sense, the natural means we have. It's talking about grace, Forgiving. It's talking about God releasing to us special favor to be able to give beyond what we would normally give. Now, this, I think, is a really big point because the reality is for most of us, an increase in our salary leads to an increase in our standard of living. Wow, I'm suddenly earning more than I did before. I can get a new car. I'm earning more every hour than I was before. It's time for the renovation of the kitchen. It's time for the new dishwasher. It's time for the new wardrobe. Our increase becomes an increase in our standard of living versus an increase in our standard of giving. Hey, what I'm saying is this. What if God gave you that 
so that you could look at it and say, with this increase, I'm going to feed five children more a year in Liberia. Or I'm going to educate a whole classroom of children. Or I'm going to meet the needs of the many charitable organizations that I'm involved with in the life of the church. God has given me increase. Could it be that that increase has come so that my generosity might abound? I believe that this is what he's talking about when he's talking about a grace for giving. And so our giving is to be an act of worship to God and an expression of love for others. As we have seen previously in this course, worship involves sacrifice and true love gives sacrificially. You know, we see this in John 3:16, for God so loved the world, he gave. He gave. Love gives. The early church clearly grasped this truth. Therefore, when deciding what to give, you should determine a figure with which you feel comfortable and then go beyond it. You want to know how we really honor God in our finances? We, we look at what is reasonable. We look at what we can comfortably do and then we go beyond it. You see, it's kind of like exercise. It's like working out. How do you know if you only exercise to your comfort levels, you never grow, you never expand, you never increase, you never become stronger? It's exactly the same in your giving. If your giving is always within your comfort zones, you will not grow and become strong in giving. It has to be willing and joyful. It says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. God loves a cheerful giver. Listen, that word cheerful there is better translated hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. You know, it always reminds me, a friend of mine, he was a leader in a church in London. Uh, he had a guest speaker coming in and... Um, and uh, basically what happened is this guest speaker was a, a guy called Hugh Thompson. And in the church that he led, he had taught on giving hilariously. And he'd done such a good job of it that when he announced the offering, there would be spontaneous applause in his people. People would cheer and whoop and holler when the offering was announced. It just became the practice of their church because he had taught on, hey, God wants us to not have this murmuring attitude when the collection goes around, but a sense of, hey, we get to sow into the purpose of God, yay! And so he was visiting this church and he was waiting to be announced. And the guy said, OK, and so we're going to take up the offering now. Hugh began to whoop and holler and yay, great, you know, and and uh, everybody there is just looking at him, you know. And then the guy's about to announce him said, and the offering this morning will be for Hugh Thompson. So. <laughs> Again, our giving is to speak of grace, not law, and of wholehearted love for God and others. If we are reluctant, something is wrong that needs to be put right. We should always be able to rejoice in the privilege we have to give, be it much or little. We see this in 2 Corinthians 8, 12. Just want to say, always we must remember, you know, we cannot outgive God. You know that, don't you? God is always going to see whatever we give as really a sowing into his intention to pour back to us. So never be reluctant, never be miserable in your giving. It should never be with a twisted arm that we give to God. We need to practice this generous, responsive giving to him. And so with these general principles in place, we can now move on to look at particular types of giving. Tithes. Tithe means tenth. The first biblical record of tithing is in Genesis 14, 17 to 20, where Abraham, then called Abram, tithes to the priest and king Melchizedek, who interestingly, in light of the earlier subject, offered him bread and wine. 
In Genesis 28, 20 to 22, we see Jacob vowing to tithe. Tithing was subsequently included in the law of Moses. See, for example, Leviticus 27, 30 to 33. So again, just to say this, tithe means tenth, okay? Just, I know it's sort of like a weird religious term, but it just means tenth. And so the, the reason I, I just want to point out this tithing being a tenth is because sometimes people will say to me, I tithe 5% of my income. And I want to say to them at that point, well, that's fine, but that's not tithing. Uh, what you're giving is a 20th of your income, not a 10th of your income. Okay. So, and I'm so grateful in God that he does give us a 10th because honestly, it's simple. I like tithing because it is so simple. You know, if I earn a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars, I give 10. If I earn a thousand, I give a hundred. I'm so glad that God doesn't bring a statistic like you're supposed to give 9.64%. Otherwise I wouldn't give anything because I just spend my whole time trying to work out what I'm supposed to give. And the truth is I'm thankful because not many of us are wise, you know? So, um, uh, the reality is if you're able to work out such things, you're probably not in the kingdom anyway, you know, because God doesn't save many people like you. So God keeps it nice and simple for us, doesn't he? All right. Some think that tithing has no relevance for Christians under the new covenant. While it's true that tithing is not specifically commanded in the New Testament, there are several reasons why we should not reject it. For example, one. Though tithing was included in the Mosaic law, we have seen that it did not originate there, but rather with Abraham. We can therefore assume that tithing, like marriage and one day of rest in seven, is a principle that, though later embodied in the law, is of a more enduring nature. Okay, so you understand what I'm saying here? It doesn't turn up with the law. It turns up with Abraham, the father of the faithful. It turns up with the one of whom we are children. We are sons of Abraham. Okay, so it's embodied in the law, but it existed before. And just like one day's rest in seven is a principle that then became part of the law, but then went on beyond the law, it's the same with this type of thing we would see. Two, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1 to 10 specifically references Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek to emphasize the fact that it was of greater significance than tithing to the Levitical priesthood. I want you to understand what I'm addressing here, guys. Although tithing was embodied in the law, what the writer of Hebrews does here is he directly connects the tithing to Melchizedek of Abraham prior to the law in connection with the tithing that he's teaching of in Christ in the New Testament. There's a direct correlation here between the value of the principle being in Abraham connecting directly to Christ versus connecting to Moses. We are elsewhere in scripture exhorted to follow the example of Abraham, the father of the faithful. See, for example, Galatians 3, 6 to 9. Why would we not follow his example in this faith-filled act of devotion? Number four, perhaps most significantly for us, Jesus affirmed the practice of tithing when he rebuked the legalistic and hypocritical Pharisees. He said in Matthew 23, 23, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So Jesus here is not saying, yeah, it wasn't important that you tithe. He's just saying there are some things that are more important than tithing that you shouldn't have actually overlooked. But he also says, but you should have done this without neglecting those other things as well. Five, we have already seen that in the New Testament, we are directed to give systematically and in proportion to our income. On what basis would we assume that living in the good of the new covenant with its far greater blessings, we would give proportionately less than under the old covenant? 
What we're saying, guys, is everything is bigger and better under grace. Why would we think that our giving, therefore, should be less? For all these reasons, we teach the, listen to this word carefully, the principle of tithing and strongly encourage its practice. I want to make very clear, we do not teach the law of tithing. Okay, we teach it as a principle. We say, hey, this is the wisdom of God passed on throughout the ages, includes this principle. And in this principle comes amazing promised blessing to our lives. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But basically what we're saying is this. Nobody's going to be chasing people down to make sure that they're properly tithing. That doesn't happen in our churches. In fact, I would just say this. In reality, the two times when we tend to get into conversations about tithing, one is when people are in great financial challenge and they're actually coming to the church to have help because we want to teach them how to honor God in their finances to release blessing over their lives. So we will teach them on tithing at that point. We will teach them the principles of how to handle their money the other instance is within leadership, because we believe the leaders of our church should be men and women who are examples to the church of the principles and the practices we teach. So if somebody's a leader in the church, particularly employed leaders and what have you, we would actually expect them to be an example in their financial giving, uh, at least to the extent of tithing. Okay, so the use of the tithe. In the Old Testament, the tithe supported the Levites, the religious leaders of the people. They were thereby freed from regular work to concentrate on religious duties. The principle of financially supporting those who minister to the people of God flows into the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 9.14 says the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. And 1 Timothy 5.17 says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, here referring to financial reward, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Tithes are therefore usually used for people, the support of the ministries of the church and visiting speakers, wages for support staff, gifts for overseas workers, help for the needy in the church and so on. And so that's where tithes typically go towards. And again, because we don't teach tithing as a law, we don't feel that we're actually bound to treat it as the law would. But generally speaking, it goes towards people. You know, one of the things that I want to say is that um, it's often amazed me over the years how many people have expressed how much they really appreciate the leadership of the church. You know, they've been people that have been really outspoken of how much care they've received. And indeed, oftentimes people that have had loads of input and care and involvement of leaders, you know, sometimes when we have to do the annual sort of review of financial giving, um, it can be pretty soul destroying to see that some of those people have given really little, virtually nothing towards actually supporting the care that they've drawn on to such a degree. And, you know, sometimes that I want to say, and I don't usually, but sometimes I just want to say, you know, at the end of the day, as much as your platitudes of thanksgiving and as much of your expressions are nice, you know, at the end of the day, these leaders have, that they have to put a roof over their heads and they have children to support and they have cars to drive. And, you know, really your giving is you, the true reflection of where your heart is. It's not what you say, you see, because you give where your heart is. That's, that's how this works, you know? So, so I always want to encourage you, you know, Christian leaders, they don't, you know, it's not pennies from heaven. You know, they don't wake up in the morning and go out and pick up manna that's been provided. It comes through the support, the loving support of the people that they're caring for. Okay, practicing tithing. The following two questions often arise when people are considering tithing. Do I calculate the tithe on my gross income or my net income? Well, listen, Proverbs 3, 9 to 10 says this, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. 
And so the principle here is the principle of first fruits. Now, again, I don't want to go into too much detail, but in the last session, I talked about the benefits and the value of what happens through our taxable giving. When we give tax, we're not paying for nothing. It might feel like nothing, but if you go to a country where there's no taxes, you'll find there's also no police force, no taking away of your garbage, no hospitals, no care, no road system. You pay something for living in a community and it's called tax, okay? So first fruit therefore would be before the benefit of paying taxes. The tithe is to be a tenth of your income, not a tenth of what is left of your income. Though most of us have tax automatically deducted from our salary, our hearts should still be that the Lord receives first. The tithe should therefore be calculated before tax. Do I have to give all the tithe to the church or can I divide it between different recipients, e.g. the church, a Christian TV ministry, a charity, and people I know who are in need? Malachi 3.10a says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. The tithe is for the local spiritual house or community to which you belong. Other desired giving would constitute offerings. And so the tithe should really go to the spiritual authority that cares for you. That's making sure that the whole tithe goes to where it should go. The other thing that I want to say about this as well is part of the principle of tithing that is so important for our hearts is actually the releasing of that 10% outside of our control. You see, the thing is about it is if you look at your tithing from a point of view of determining where things go, how many of you know the thing is in your control still? Mm -hmm. The whole principle of tithing is I consider this the Lord's. Mm -hmm. I consider this specifically given to the Lord and I have no hands-on control over it. It goes where God determines it should go, not where I determine it should go. You see, there's times when uh, people have actually withdrawn their tithe when they've not liked what the leadership are teaching or saying, or maybe they're not liked how they've been handled. Can I just say that is a disgraceful way of controlling leaders? How dare we ever use money to control leaders in such a way? Now, the principle of tithing is I recognize this is spiritual government that I'm connected to and that cares for me. And I give and release that to the Lord. Let God do with it as he chooses to do with it. It's part of his lordship being expressed over our finances. Next is offerings. God does not limit us to one tenth. Yay, they all <laughs> cheered. <laughs> That is just the starting point. What we give beyond the tithe constitutes offerings. Whereas tithes are primarily for people, offerings are usually applied towards outgoings. For example, evangelism, buildings, utilities, special projects, etc. This distinction is, however, a guideline rather than a strict rule. For example, we may from time to time take up an offering for the poor. So it's kind of going to people, but in that particular case, it's still a special offering. That very example leads us to a third type of giving required by the Lord and identified in scripture, giving to the poor. Proverbs 19, 17a says, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. What a concept, lending to the Lord. You know, many have said over the years that God is no man's debtor. It's not an actual scripture, but many commentators have uh, drawn conclusions from scripture to say it's clear that God is no man's debtor. And uh, what it means is that our lending to the poor is always an investment. It's always an investment with a return because God will see to it that he pours back upon us. God's heart for the poor and needy is clear throughout scripture. He directs us to identify with and manifest his heart to them in practical ways. 
We each have an individual responsibility in this regard, and as a church, we are committed to giving to the poor, both in our congregation and beyond. The finance test, 2 Corinthians 8, 8 says this, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Only Paul could get away with this. He's saying, listen, I'm, I'm not commanding you here, but I am testing you. I'm testing how sincere your love is by comparing it to the generosity of other believers. I mean, it's amazing. It's certainly not how we speak about money in England, that's for sure. He'd go over terribly there. Anyway, we mentioned at the beginning of this section that our approach to money reveals our heart. Some Christians become offended when challenged in the area of giving, but Paul had no qualms about it being a basis on which to judge real love for God and his people. However, God is also willing to put himself to the test in this area. Another amazing scripture, Malachi uh, 3 verses 10b says this, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. The principle of the blessing that flows from this obedience to God is also clear in the New Testament. Luke 6, 38 says this, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Receiving is not to be a motivation for giving. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. But as we give, we will surely be blessed so that we can in turn bless others and glorify God. Brothers and sisters, we will never outgive God. Just the bottom line, you will, I will never outgive God. The principles of God is give generously, give hilariously, give in a way of abundance because the measure you use will determine the measure that God will pour back into you. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 and 10 and 11 say this, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. You know, if I was to just start in this room in this session to begin to ask you to give testimonies of God's faithfulness in your life as you were challenged to give and you did, this session would be unending. Mm -hmm. We would just go on and on and on because the reality is God shows his faithfulness to us in so many ways. The miracle that many of us have known of actually having more with the 90% than somehow we had with 100%. It's a mathematical oddity, but it's our experience over and over again that somehow, as we honored God, we had more with the 90 than we had with the 100. How did that happen? Because God is faithful. And I wanna say this, according to even this scripture, it's not always that God's multiplication back into our life is in the same area that we sowed in. You know, sometimes in God, you sow in this field and you reap in this field, but God provides for you. You know, there has been times, in all honesty, that people have come to me and said, you know, 
I began tithing and I can't honestly say I'm better off. I can't honestly say the floodgates were opened over my life. And the first thing that I would say is, you know, it's not like God's a slot machine. It's not like he's a genie in a bottle or something. Sometimes you've got to actually outwork this over a period of time to see the faithfulness of God unfold. For some, it's immediate, but for many, it's over time. So sometimes I will talk about the actual patience, imitate those who by faith and patience mm -hmm. inherit the promises of God. It's faith and patience, okay? Um, but sometimes I'll say to those people, okay, that's interesting, you know, that's unusual. Most people's testimony is things turn around quite a lot as they become faithful. And But oftentimes I'll just say to them, hey, out of interest, has anything happened in your life positive since you started to give? And it's amazing how often they'll say, oh, oh yeah, some amazing thing. You know, my daughter who we were praying for last year, who was completely off the rails and not walking with God. Well, she's come back to the Lord and she's now serving God. And it's amazing. And, uh, and you remember, you know, my wife was having that difficulty that, you know, the, the issue of pain that she was suffering. And, yeah. Somehow that has just changed and, and it, you know, everything's sort of moving on positively in that area and what we were reaching for over here. And sometimes I'll stop and say, if you could have put a monetary value on your daughter doing as well as she is in God now versus where you were at the beginning, what sort of value would you have put on it? You say, I couldn't put a value on it. It's worth everything to me. And I said, well, isn't it interesting that you've begun to reap in this amazing field over here that you weren't sowing in, but you were sowing in this field over here? You see, oftentimes we're just too dull of sight to actually recognize the flow of the blessing of God. But listen, this scripture talks about him supplying seed to the sower. He talks about us being enriched in every way, in every way, so that we can be generous in every occasion, okay? So it's not as simple as sometimes we tend to think it to be. There is no limit on the timing of God. There's no limit on his faithfulness. I just wanna to say to people, listen, even if you don't see it in this life, that's not the be all and end all. The faithfulness of God is beyond the grave. But for most of us, we experience the faithfulness of God in life too. And there's no area where we see this as richly outworked as in the handling of our finances. So I just wanna encourage you in closing, open your heart to God, ask him to change your heart, soften your heart, uh, just cause your heart to be responsive to him in this area. I promise you, according to the word of God, that you will know his blessing in many, many ways. Okay, thanks again for your listening in this session. In the next sessions, we're going to be looking at the subject of biblical manhood and womanhood. Look forward to that.